welcome to the Good News Only, where you only hear good things about good people. My name is Tanya McIntyre, and I am passionate about positive media. And I'm passionate about positive media for a really good reason. You know, I spent 22 years in negative mainstream media. I was a broadcast journalist for all that time. And in all those years in mainstream media, I finally realized that there's an agenda. And that agenda is to perpetuate what I call the FUD factor. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Perpetuating that FUD factor is the agenda of mainstream media. And my passion now in positive media is to live that passion to offset all the negative media that we're exposed to in life. So I founded The Good News Only in 2010 to offset all that negative stuff we're exposed to on a regular basis. And The Good News Only is bringing you good stories about good people. And there's lots of good things happening in the world and lots of good people. And we have one of those good people with us for this episode of The Good News Only. Priya Ali has led a successful coaching practice since 2007. It's called Living 365. It's dedicated to personal and professional growth of its clients, facilitating positive and productive thought processes and behaviors. How about that? Welcome, Priya Ali, to the Good News Only. Great to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I love being with the Good News Only. Well, thank you, Priya. And I love being aligned with like-minded people. And I love what you're doing, Priya. Productive thought processes and behaviors. And I have to say, not only are you a dedicated entrepreneur, Priya, but you're also a mother of four. So uh, (laughs) no doubt you know a lot about behaviors and thought processes. Certainly do. (laughs) How do, you, how do you juggle all of that with uh, four children and all of your entrepreneurial endeavors? Lots of alcohol. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. What we do is um, basically just really staying focused on, you know, what it is that we want, individualizing. And, and that's a big part of my practice as well as my parenting is customizing and recognizing that everybody's needs are individual. And so when you get into, you know, not treating everybody with sort of, one, you know, painting with one paintbrush, that really helps to, you know, people are getting their, their requirements and their needs met. And I just find that it works a lot more effectively. It's interesting, Priya, that you're talking about individual, individuality. You know, I just had a conversation with someone recently who is a health practitioner. Mm-hmm. And she said the challenge is now, uh, even though the medical community tends to be moving toward a more um, evidence-based approach, to medicine, there, there's still so many variables with individuals because we're all individuals. I mean, that's what it means to be an individual. Each of us yeah. are, are set up dif- differently. We're wired differently. I often joke with my husband, we've been together 25 years now, and I'm amazed that we can perpetuate a species. We are so different men and women. And Everybody is different. I mean, you know about law of attraction, vibration. We're all just kind of vibrating uh, bubbles bouncing around this vibrating universe. And you know that when you walk in a room, you pick up the vibe of that environment immediately. You know, you either say, oh, wow, this place has got great vibes or, oh, I don't like the vibe in this place. It's pretty bad. And we're in tuned, I think, to those vibrations in each other. I mean, it takes five seconds maybe 10, to decide whether or not you connect with somebody. And this health practitioner was saying because of all those um, variables for individuals, there really needs to be a more individual approach in the medical community when, when dealing with people because of all those different variables. You know, people heal differently. And she had an interesting um, concept that we were we were throwing around as well about you know we're we're encouraged to take care of our physical being mm-hmm. yeah. uh, you know even when we are working with corporations and have medical benefits we can go and get so many massages we can be covered by physio physiotherapy and chiropractic visits and dental visits and you know um, f- pharmacy prescription coverage but there's very little attention given to mental health. 
Yes, there is. It, that's so true. There is very little um, attention given and, and basically regard for it. And, you know, most disease starts from stress within the body, which usually is triggered by emotional disharmony. So it would be, it seems like a really logical place to get started, but somehow, you know, we're a little slow on the uptake with that. But I do think that more and more it is being recognized. Um, <clears throat> mental health awareness has significantly increased amongst uh, not just our society and communities, but also through corporate world as well, because they are recognizing. Uh, I think we've probably suffered our, some of our highest rates of burnout in the last decade that we ever have seen. And so I think it's actually, you know, sort of forced the hands of people to recognize what's causing this. And as you say, and as the health practitioner you were speaking to uh, was, was referencing as well, is that every, every um, remedy or, you know, whatever we're applying in terms of trying to heal our beings. So imagine if you and I are, have the same uh, disharmony or ailment and we both go home, but you're, you, maybe you're going home, you're in a little bit more, I'm sure it's not any less hectic, but just for the purpose of examples, you're going home to uh, your spouse, I'm going home to single momhood of four kids. Our, our body's physiologies in terms of how we might process stress might be different. So even though we're taking the same remedy for that thing that ails us, that's exactly the same, the way that we process those things through our body is going to be vastly different because our body is in a different state and a different type of condition. Absolutely. That's exactly it. We are, um, you know, our environment is going to have such an influence on how we recover from certain things as well. If I'm going home to a nurturing environment, I'm, I've got a, a lot better chance of healing a lot faster. Exactly. So when did you start making that connection, uh, Priya? I mean, you know, you've got four children. Uh, uh. I think parenting is the most important job in the world. So when you undertake that job of parenting, where do you start even to, to reflect within to make, start making connections about m emotional health and well-being when you're, you're trying to meet all the physical demands, not of just your life, but your four children? It's very different. I think because I, I'm a third-generation intuitive and healer as well, I have a bit of, a, of a, an up jump on things. But also just as a, I, I think as parents, as you are connected to your children, the more self-aware you become, the more aware you become of those around you. And I think for me, I personally started making connections with my body um, and its own, you know, capabilities and healing. From the time I was about 13, I became interested in alternative medicine. Uh, I was the nerd reading books about refle reflexology while everybody else was going to school dances. So things like that where I started to make connections about how my body worked, what types of things, um, you know, caused different reactions, what things did I respond to well, what things did I not respond to well. And so paying attention to that as a mother in, um, you know, rearing my children both physically, as you say, and emotionally and recognizing uh, even something simple as sleep. They're between the four of them. They're, they differ vastly in the amount of sleep that they require and what time they go to bed. The two of them are late sleepers. Two of them are early sleepers, which means, you know, it, it, even in trying to acknowledge that when you have a family and say you're, doing, you're engaged in an activity, it's something that you have to be mindful of that, okay, well, two of these are going to start conking out at about 9.30, where the other ones can go till 2 in the morning if you let them. So just making those types of observations, paying attention to their, their body language, watch their eating patterns. These are all indicators when we're observing people's behaviors as to where there might be something up, something, you know, going on with them. So I watch their eating habits. I watch their sleeping habits. I watch their, you know, kind of what they're doing in terms of their um, extracurricular time. Are they actually engaging in something that they like? Are they, you know, adverting that? Are they interacting with us as a family? Are they be more in their rooms on their own? So these are all the cues that I look for as a parent and have started observing as I was, you know, uh, raising the kids. And right now they range in age from 7 to 18. And it can something that continues on. Um, and also, you know, just to speak to that individuality, recognizing that just as something so simple as their diet, it's, it's, it's difficult as a single mom to put a meal on the table and meet everyone's individual needs, but they, to recognize, I had to recognize they're all different. Hmm. Wow. Well, that's a challenge. I'm not sure. I never had the courage to be a parent, uh, Priya, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what the household would have been like if I had to cater to more than one individual when it came to eating habits. I don't think I would. I think I'd be 
likely the kind of parent that would say, eat what's in front of you. Yeah, and I started off that way, but I recognize, you know, you kind of, you know, I sort of started with the once they were able to, to receive this message, there's four of you, there's a one in four chance you're going to like what's on the table once a, <laughs> once a week. <laughs> because I try to cater to ever, what somebody likes it one day of the week at least. But I also started to recognize in their nutritional needs that things were different. You know, I have a 16-year-old son who plays sports. He needs more protein. He needs more carbs than, say, my, you know, younger son who's not as um, physically active, has some different requirements in the way his body's growing and what he does. He's more of a, he's identified as gifted. He uses his brain a lot more so, you know, a little more brain food for him. It just things like that. So what I actually started doing was, recognizing what kind of vitamins they need individually, and then making shakes in the morning. So these shakes pretty much contain every nutrient they could possibly require for the entire day. So this way, once they've got those shakes in their body, I know anything they put in after that is, is just icing on the cake, so to speak. <laughs> and it just kind of let me off the mom guilt card as well of having to worry about who didn't get what, what, I, what kind of dinner you know we had that day, and all that kind of stuff. So that really helped me with, you know, meeting their needs physically that way. Ooh, very good time management strategy there, Priya. <laughs> I know, like, <laughs> all right, everybody's had their nutritional requirements and their daily, from the Daily Food Guide, met by 9 o'clock in the morning. So anything you do on top of that is just bonus. <laughs> now, Priya, you mentioned you are a third-generation intuitive. Yes. What does that mean? Um, so in my, my mother's uh, generation herself and her, some of her siblings, as well as my grandmother, uh, we have a heightened state of intuitive ability. Everybody is born with intuitive abilities um, as well as healing abilities. So these are things that, you know, if um, I'm able to, I, I personally am clairvoyant, so I see things um, in my mind's eye that other people, or I see visions that other people don't necessarily see. Hmm. They're audience. So I hear on a different frequency than other people. Um, I'm clairsentient, so I feel other people's emotions as well as their physical ailments in my own being. And I'm claircognizant, which means I know things about people that I can't explain or I don't, I've never been given the knowledge prior to, so I just know them without knowing how I know them. Um, and then from the healing side of things, I'm able to perform um, certain healings that help to change the energy in people and also that which can lead to the healing of physical ailments as well. Hmm. Now you say everybody has that gift. Yes. Why do you think it develops in some and not others? I think it's like anything. The example that I usually give is Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods' father was a golfer and so he loved golf and actually one of the reasons Tiger's such a great golfer is from the time he was little he saw his dad with a golf club, he wanted to emulate him, he would, you know, sit there with his swing. So it's kind of in the genes for him already. Uh, so it's, it's a little more, um, he's already exposed to it. He's already, it's part of something that his physical DNA, because these are types of things when we, we're exposed to them and we have children, they pass down into the genes and the DNA of our kids. So, he, you know, somebody's already sort of predetermined for, for certain things. And because um, for me personally, it's something that had been practiced and acknowledged in my family over the generations. It's something that was a little more heightened for me. On top of that, I did professionally spend time honing the skill. So I think from that perspective, that's where there might be some people who are a little bit more, um, have more of a heightened state of intuition or awareness. And also, um, and they believe in it. So, it, you know, it's, it's very hard to practice something you don't believe in. And a lot of people feel that intuition or um, energy healing is just hocus pocus. Mm, yes. And, you know, I, I often reflect back to my own upbringing with my dad always saying, trust your intuition. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've, I think everybody's been brought up with somebody saying that, I sh you know, I should have trusted my intuition. Why didn't I trust my intuition? I had an inkling that this was going to go badly. Yep. And lo and behold, it has. Why didn't I listen? Yes. So it could be it, that, that little voice. Definitely something that happens a lot that people don't trust their intuition. And we're, we're in some ways taught not to as much as people say to. But it's like, well, I got even from babies. From babies will trust, they, they know who they are a vibrational match to. Mm. And so, or energetic match. When we were talking earlier about vibes and when you walk into a room, when you put a baby in someone's arms, they know if they're feeling that vibe. It doesn't mean that person's, you know, good, bad, positive, negative, or anything like that. The baby just knows which vibe matches them. 
but when and as kids grow older babies cry when they don't feel the vibe with somebody so then we hopefully take them back but sometimes what we do with some babies is we make them stay with that person until they calm down <laughs> so we start to teach kids from a very young age Although you're vibrationally getting a message telling you intuitively what is a match for you and what isn't, it's not polite for it not to be a match for you to say hello to someone or sit on someone's knee or give them a hug or give them a kiss. Mm. It's not polite. So in, from a young age, we start to, even when you tell a child not to cry, intuitively they, you know, in, they feel that whatever it is, is they're expressing some sort of disharmony within themselves energetically. And we tell them, no, no, that's not okay. Wow. So it gets very confusing, and we start to doubt our intuition slowly as we grow because more and more we're, it is being questioned. And after a while, when something gets questioned after a while, you start to question it too, oftentimes. And it's early on. I, I read somewhere recently that most of our learning and development is done in the first three years of our lives. We learn more in those first three years than we do in any other time of our life. I will tell you, I actually um, dropped out of high school, but I did manage to get back into night school um, in my 20s, and I, took, I studied early childhood education. And to this day, 20-some-odd years later, I can tell you it was the best program I could ever have taken because you are exactly right, and pretty much it, in order to relate to anybody, if you understand how we develop between the, the, the ages of birth and three and how we um, begin to create our model of the world, how we process information, how we interact with people, how we um, create our own sense of self-awareness and, and, and our own self-esteem, it really enabled me to deal with everybody and anybody. Because you'll find, too, when people get to that stage, those, those parts of us that are not developed, in, um, in a positive way or to the fullest extent that they could be, when they, because they haven't developed those areas, when they act as an adult, you'll see people revert and you're like, why are you being so childish? It comes down to them kind of going back because that's the last set of data that they have and how to cope with a situation like that. Mm -hmm. And so they revert back to that, that age group and that mentality because they've never really gotten to that space. And so, you, you know, you'll be, you'll, you'll hear, I'll hear couples fighting when I do couples coaching or whatever. It's like, grow up. Well, yeah, that person just is back in that space that they were in because that's the last, you know, mental capacity they have for dealing with those types of areas of their life. Interesting. And, of course, then we have those negative core beliefs that settle into our psyche very early on as well. We've got the fact that we feel unlovable, we feel unsafe, we feel undeserving, and we feel like we're never good enough. Those four negative core beliefs really kind of saturate our psyche early on. And because uh, I was inundated with negative media for so long, I am convinced that the messages we receive from mainstream media, there is a direct correlation to how we feel physically and how those negative core beliefs are underlined and reinforced by those negative messages of media. And I'm curious to know how you feel about that. Absolutely. Um, as you know, like, as I said, as, in, as somebody that works and practices in energy healing medicine um, and, and works in energy a lot, I can actually be in a room with a television on and f would not be watching the show, but actually feel the energy of the show. Um, and so just by hearing it. So I can tell you, just even even if you're not paying attention to the news and you just have it on in the background, like I know some people that keep CNN on all day long or you go to certain establishments mm -hmm. and they have CNN on all day long, it's just creating negative energy in that environment over and over again. And I don't think people realize it. because no, I, they don't. And I, when I talk to people about this topic, they almost get defensive. They say, oh, you know, you're, you're so Pollyanna. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're just living with your, your head stuck in the sand. And I said, no, that's not what this is about at all. When I am uh, perpetuating positive media, mm -hmm. I'm encouraging people to think for themselves and just be aware of what they're absorbing into their minds. Because like you said, a lot of it could be absorbed by osmosis, just having something playing in the background. Even negative song lyrics on playing on a radio can be absorbed exactly and that's a huge one because i mean there's a song right now on the radio 
by Adam Levine. It's such a catchy little tune, and I love it. But I stop. I, I keep trying, or, um, encouraging myself not to listen to it because the song is about a guy talking about he doesn't want to know who's taking the girl home that he used to date with, and it's somebody new he keeps hearing from. And it's like, I don't want to know who's taking you home. And if you're in a relationship and you're actually regurgitating this on a positive vibration, you could actively be bringing that into your into your own life because you, energetically, vibrationally, you're speaking something into existence. Mm -hmm. And as you know, studying law of attraction, the universe as well as our subconscious mind don't hear the words don't not know. That's right. So what you're actually singing is, I want to know who's taking you home tonight. So you're actually bringing that into your vibration. And you're doing it so joyfully because you love the beat of the music that you're actually offering no resistance. Mm -hmm. So it just flows right in. And people don't realize that. I mean, when you go to restaurants, if you don't believe in vibrations, go to restaurants. Go Find out. There are studies done in restaurants with the music that you they play, ambient music, eclectic music, that they know makes you thirstier mm -hmm. and hungrier. It's true. I mean, right? marketing is set up to manipulate those very emotions. Exactly. So, and it, and when you're talking about the news, that's another thing. Is news is perspective. You know, you really the very little, a very small percentage of the news is actually observational reporting. It is always, generally speaking, it always comes with somebody's perspective or inference. Mm -hmm. based on what they're reporting on. It always comes with somebody's perspective, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then you're also talking about, um, you know, uh, things that are speculative. So we always get, like, these, these warnings that this could happen. My, my favorite example of this is about two or three, maybe top four years ago. Um, it came out, a report came out, the, the United States credit rating was going to be a B. It wasn't an A. Mm -hmm. It was a B. And... Everybody went into a panic. Now, the day before, their credit rating was a B, and everything was fine. But because it got reported on the news, and it sparked, and they said, we have to be careful, and people literally started pulling their money out of the bank and stuffing it under their mattress because they didn't know what to do, and it created a crash in the stock market. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Based on nothing, it was already in existence, but just because of the reporting it and speculating what could happen as a result of this, mm -hmm. it actually created the thing that people were afraid of. It's done all the time, and that's my passion for positive media is to just make people aware of that. The agenda of mainstream media is to perpetuate that FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That is the machine that drives it. Yes. And there's finally, I think now, um, you know, as, as much as we honor celebrity culture, yeah. it's, you know, people listen to celebrities when they go on um, and make statements about something that they, you know, everybody has an opinion about everything. But when celebrities get on the soapbox and say something, it's like, oh, hallelujah, yes. Yeah. So and so said it, so it must be it true. Must be true. Or it, it, it's something that I should, I should consider. So you're like, okay, but it just, it, it's one of those things too with the with where you're looking at where the culture of, of society is, is that people are more comfortable with the negative than with the positive because it's more familiar to them. Well, yeah, because they're bombarded with it on a regular basis. You know, we're spending a third of our lives now in front of screens, whether it's yeah. our phone or our tablet or computer or television. I mean, I, you can't even stand at an elevator anymore without looking at a screen now. They have advertising screens yep. near elevators. And it's just a bombardment of messages, most of them negative. And that's why I just want people just to be aware. You don't need to stick your, your head in the sand, but just know that... When you're exposing yourself to news, mainstream media, you are not necessarily being informed. You're being misinformed, if anything. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. But we're so we're living um, almost so oblivious because so many of us are on autopilot that we're not consciously choosing what we feed our brains with. I, I can tell you so many people pay attention to what clothes they put on their body in the morning. Um, we're going on about exactly, you know, what we eat in our food and if, if it's organic and GMO. And all. People are not deliberately choosing what they put, what kind of thoughts and information and vibrations they ingest into their being. Mm. And my thing is to really encourage people to be a little bit more deliberate about what you're choosing to feed your mind with. Mm 
and what you're choosing to sort of feed your soul with because those are important parts of you and we're just kind of you know going with emotions and we get so caught up in the day-to-day and those screens and that media can be so distracting and so captivating that we just get caught up in it. Well now you're you're raising four kids between the ages of what seven and 18. Yes. What challenges come with that? I mean, they are exposed to so much now. I can't imagine growing up in this era. It is very different. I am seeing a huge difference because, as I said, they're 18 and the youngest is 7. There is a gap between my 16 and 18-year-old and my uh, 7 and 9-year-old. And I even noticed a difference in the way that they actually um, engage in things because we didn't have as much technology when my older kids were uh, were a little bit older. So I've seen the differences. And it's just like they can get lost in, in it. It has its pluses and minuses. I mean, there's the, the amount of time they spend on it. It's how much they, they're engaging in it. But I do also see the benefits of how quickly they have access to information that also promotes their learning and expands even the capacity of a lesson you could teach them or, or share information. So it does have its pros and cons, but it is a real challenge to not sit at a table sometimes and have like six phones going off. You've got four kids and yourself and each everybody has a device. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, okay, we need to put them away, try to put them away at the dinner table. But me being guilty sometimes because I'm working, I'm the one that's got the phone there. And how do I set the example of saying you can't have your phone when I do? Well, and that's so important, setting example, right? I mean, because I remember growing up and I'm thinking, well, you're doing it. Why can't I? Especially when I was watching a parent smoking, you know, it's like, yeah, of course, we are going to uh, you're supposed to be modeling behavior as a parent. No pressure there, Priya. (laughs) No, not not whatsoever, right? (laughs) But I mean, digital suggesting a digital detox to a teenager, you know, I mean, yeah, come on. How is that going to go over? Well, and the other thing part of it, too, is the access that they, the world that, the level of, um, I don't like to use the word control with parenting, but the level of boundaries that you're able to set for your children these days with the, the digital access, because they have access to people all over the world. People all over the world have access to them in some capacity or another, whether it be their information. You know, next thing you know, I can't track them all the time. There's little apps that come on. Do you want to allow us to know where your location is? I don't know who owns that app. All of a sudden now they ha- they know where my kid is. Yeah. It's you know, quite a challenge. It, it's a, it is a, a different time of raising kids. Like I said, there are benefits to it, but there are a few downsides that I do find challenging, um, a, again, as well as just the types of things that, you know, when you're a kid, you don't necessarily uh, pay attention to what you're posting on social media and how that might impact you later on or how it makes you appear um, you know, how you could be misunderstood. Oh, my gosh. Even as adults, we have that dilemma, don't we? Yes, 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 <laughs> we do. But, but you know, you, you look at it from, a ch- from children's perspectives, and I see this, you know, some of the shows that I do, and, and I watch what kids are doing on social media, um, and as you say, adults as well. But, at, you know, at least kids are sort of like they don't, they just don't recognize it as yet. Mm-hmm. There are certain choices that they might make, with their social media that can impact. I mean, employers, now it's a common practice for employers to scope your social media prior to hiring you. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Something to keep in mind for sure. Priya, we have yes. already been talking for almost 30 minutes. We've got one minute to wrap it up. I can't believe it. We could talk easily for another hour. And we <laughs> haven't even touched base with your 365 TV network. I want to talk to you more about that as well. But in the meantime, right now, I want you to leave us with your wish for the future. My wish for the future is exactly what my company is called, is Living 365. And that's for everybody to, in wherever you are in your life, with whatever you have, whatever you don't have, wherever you're not even at, is for you to live each day as though this was your last and just put everything into it. Engage in the activities that you that make your heart sing, that make you feel joyful, that bring more ease to your life. And do that on a regular basis on Living 365. Awesome. Thank you so much. Priya Ali, successful coach since 2007. And her entity is living365.ca. You can connect with Priya and learn all about the amazing work she's doing. She's dedicated to personal and professional growth of her clients. And I'm sure that you would want to stay connected with Priya forever. I know I want to be. 
Thanks so much for joining us on The Good News Only. Remember to live well, laugh often, love always, and of course, stay positive.